everybody and Trevor you're on. Thank you very much Mike and thank you for Francis somewhere behind me and Simon for helping to, helping to sort out the, techn the technicality because I want to add a clue. Um, right, uh, Cardale Quarry, the first thing I would say is that um, when I put this together I first gave the talk last January for the Buxton Local History Society and it's the only talk that we've had this year um, and when I put it together I realised that um, quite a few people who, who would be at the meeting didn't know Buxton and they were relative newcomers and so I put in quite a few slides just to show exactly where Cardale Quarry is in relation to the town because it's a little bit hidden. Um, still include those but I'll try and whiz through them fairly quickly and um, the other thing that was happening about 12 months ago or just happened was the impending disaster at Whirley Bridge and I researched the the two railways and canals or the canal that were involved at that time because the information was a little bit sparse and the media got it all wrong and I finally managed to unravel all the dates and exactly what was going on. While I was doing that, it made me realise just how important that the limestone was to the Industrial Revolution. And why is uh, Cowdale of specific interest? First of all, it is now a scheduled monument, not an ancient monument like Liz Moorfield, just a monument because it's not that ancient. And it's scheduled for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's an example of survival of a complete process of extracting limestone and doing something with it. Um, it's scheduled for its group value, the buildings that, uh, and the infrastructure that still exists there. The rarity value, there are only five similar sites in the country, so it's of outstanding national importance. And there's also potential for buried archaeological evidence but they just pile stuff up in dips all the waste and so on and heaven knows what's underneath could be some interesting stuff and it's so recent that um, a historical documentation survives somewhere for somebody to go and do some research so the whole um, story of Cardale divides into three phases really that the half century so that it had working, another half century so well it was dormant, and attempts in recent years to try and get it up and running as a, a bottling plant. So I'm not trying to cover the detailed history of the working quarry or its the subsequent planning applications to do with the bottling plant. Um, I think they're both uh, uh, capable of, of um, having a talk on their own. Um, and just for the record, before we start, the quarry face extended to 950 metres, that's over half a mile, and it was 13 to 26 metres high. I think the uh, whole of the surface area of the quarry floor stretches to about half a mile by a quarter of a mile, and that's a huge area. And it's right on the edge of Buxton. So, um, we're through the... Um, the background to it all with the Industrial Revolution, hence the chimneys. <clears throat> Looking at what was going on around 1870, you see that the, uh, the use of coal and iron are well documented in what uh, became the Industrial Revolution. Uh, less glamorous is the chemical industry that built up alongside it, developed to support the manufacturing industries. Lime was first used or first quarried in dug holes over six, seven hundred years ago and burnt and used to uh, improve fields. So it's used in agriculture from all those years ago. With the Industrial Revolution, new uses were found for lime in bleaching and dyeing cloth, for example. It was also used to make float glass, which came along a little bit later and in 1850 or so, it was used to, um, to purify 
steel, and then steel came along. And it's always been used, of course, for buildings, walls, road surfaces, and so on. Um, and I think because of the limestone in this area, it's, it's no coincidence that um, chemical industry developed around Warrington and uh, that part of Cheshire, Runcorn and so on, and just down the road. So the, and another button, the first thing that was needed was to get the limestone from Dove Holes into the Manchester area. And the way of moving things around at that time was all to do with um, canals. And for many years after this, up to probably about 1830, tramways and railways were just thought of as an ancillary to the canal, for getting things to the canal. So the plan was to build a canal from just east of Manchester on the Ashton Canal up to as close to double holes as they could get. And it was built through Marple and up to as far as Bugsworth. And then a tramway took over, a wagonway took over, moving the stuff down from Dove Holes. Um, I think everybody's probably pretty familiar with the, the flight of locks at Marple, 15 fantastic locks, and um, the aqueduct just the other side of Marple. On the tramway, it was reasonably level up to um, Chapel Henry Firth to the where it meets um, the A6 or goes under the A6. And along that little bit, there's um, the, the world's very first railway tunnel. At Stoddart, which is um, just by Ferodo. So there's a little bit of history there. Linking it to the higher level at Dove Holes, there was the inclined plane at um, Chapel Henry Frith. So it was level from Dove Holes. The wagons were then lowered down the plane using the heavy ones going down to lift the light ones up. When it worked, I think there were frequent accidents. And um, with um, canals, of course, you need water. And the water was supplied by Coombs Reservoir. When it was built, there was a little branch line built up to um, Worley Bridge. And I think that, uh, although it's, I've not seen it stated anywhere, the reason is probably to get coal to Bugsworth to use in the kilns to burn the line before it was put on a boat. And that system worked. The combination of canal and um, the tramway worked. It was in use by 1801 and it didn't close until the 1920s. Of course, the, the, the um, canal is still in use, very much so. And it was uh, to be 30 years before the next development, and that was the Cromford and High Peak Railway. That was developed from the basin at Whaley Bridge. Um, it, initially put forward as a canal rather than a railway and the canal was to climb up from the Goit Valley through a tunnel at the top, through Ladman Low and then wander across the limestone plateau down to um, Cromford. I think the, the main instigator of that really was the uh, Cromford's Mill uh, linking um, the East Midlands with Manchester that worked in both directions, so you couldn't have uh, wagons going up and down, powered by the, the, the weight of the, the, the full ones. And um, what they did there was to have stationary steam engines at the top of each incline. Started with nine inclines and it was reduced to eight. The significance for the quarries in this area is that as soon as the railway was in place, the quarries followed it. Green quarry is a, a good example, for example. And just over the other side of um, Solomon's Temple from the Pool's Heaven. And then there was uh, Arthur Hill Quarry, a couple more, uh, and plus uh, Hill Haight Quarry and Dallow, all following the railway line. And um, There we have a picture of the Cromford High Peak from Lavenlow. 
and at the other end of the line, of course, plenty of quarries around works with. This was needed more water because there was more more uh, work on the canal, and also at, the, at that same time, they opened a branch canal around to Macclesfield, and that's what, why the Toddbrook Reservoir was built. The next big development, railway-wise, was 1863, when the Midland Railway between Derby and Manchester just bypassed Buxton with a branch line up to Buxton. Again, the quarries followed it, Millersdale, Blackwell Mill, Great Roxdale, which became Tunster Quarry, Bigdale, and the line went under the holes, and then out of the limestone area. The branch line from Millersdale up to Buxton came through Ashwood Dale, and um, there we've got quarries still at Toppy Pike and Ashwood Dale Quarry, which is close to where we're going to look at, and Cowdale Quarry, which didn't own until 30 years later but they were all triggered off by the railway. The last railway to, build, to be built was the Buxton to Ashbourne Railway, and now the High Peak Trail, and that consolidated the, the use of um, the, the railways to get uh, materials from the quarries out towards Sterndale Moor, Dowlow and, and um, Hindlow. This closed about 1956, but it's still part of it used to link the quarries with um, Tunstead, with the uh, railway wagons being brought into Buxton, reversed just below Brown Edge, and taken out through Ashford Dale. An interesting photograph here, courtesy of Mr. Google. The big white area that you see to the right is Tunster Quarry. And if you compare that with the size of Buxton on the left, where it says Buxton Fairfield, Harp Hill is almost off the map to the south. Then Tunster Quarry is big, very big. And that's the, the main surviving quarry of, uh, of all of these. On the map, let's see if I can get a pointer going here. Uh, I think you'll be able to see that. Um, King Sterndale, the word King Sterndale is covering up Toppy Pike Quarry, which is still in use. This white here is Ashwood Dale Quarry. And uh, for those of you who know or don't know the area, then if you go down Ashwood Dale, it's sort of up to the left above the Demchon's pub. Now closed, has been closed for years. Across the road, and this area is sort of looks like a, a letter C, um, line on its back a little bit and extend it. That's Cowdale Quarry, and that's where we're, we're um, going to zoom in on. Before we leave this one, there's an interesting aside here that's nothing to do with limestone, and that is here. That's Water Swallows Quarry. And that was used for quarrying basalt, uh, which is a completely different material to limestone. And basalt forms in vent pipes from volcanoes. There was a volcano somewhere near Wormhill. I shouldn't worry about it, it was about, I don't know, 100 million years plus ago. And uh, the basalt quarry, because it's following a, a vertical vent, goes straight down. And I think they, they worked as far as they could and, until the water. Um, won the argument and if you look over the edge now the, the hole is about 50 feet deep and uh, lots of water in the bottom um, not recommended unless you, you look very carefully before we leave this map um, just have a look at the this is the the trees, woods alongside the River Wye and the A6 through Ashwoodale. The little loop there in the in the valley in the river is a little um, marker really for the maps that we're going to have a, a look at next.
So this is, um, I think it's a, I don't think it's an Ordnance Survey map, an Ordnance Survey or Geographia, and uh, something like that. Here we've got um, the quarry, Gaudel Quarry. The yellow line is the boundary with the Peak Park, and the land between the Peak Park boundary and the town boundary is what's known as Special Landscape Area. So it's got a special value. It's basically a buffer zone between the town and the Peak Park. And that's all the way around Buxton. <coughs> <coughs> the little red diamonds come through the town and disappear in this direction. That's the Midshire, Midshire's Way. And at this point, it follows the top of the quarry face. So that is accessible. And it's about the only place that you can easily get access to the quarry to see what was uh, going on there. Um, I'm going to come back to this later, but little house there called Tim Lodge. It's just there on that lane. Um, I spent my teenage years during the 1950s there, and it's about the only place, with the possible exception of Bailey Fat Farm, where you can actually see into the quarry face more or less on the level. And we've got a couple of pictures of that later. And um, so that was 1953, the quarry was still working then, some argument about when it actually closed, but it was certainly working in 53. Also in this area, um, following Ashford Dale and Cunningdale, there's a triplet eye. The quarry itself is uh, designated as a regionally important geological site. And much of the area is a, a Derbyshire wildlife site because of the uh, nature of the ancient woodlands. Although a lot of trees have been lost and apparently they've been invaded by sycamores. So for those who, <coughs> who are strangers to Buxton who or, uh, haven't explored the area, here's again is um, a slightly larger scale, the quarry, related to Cowdale and um, Cowdale village you can get up this little lane I wouldn't recommend it um, the road is out here and onto the Ashburn road a 515 there so you go around that way you can park up in the village you can walk along a little track and you have to stop at the gate which says no access and there's very little to see but at least from there you can walk up to the top of the quarry face and along the Midshires Way. So I'll zoom in a little bit more. You see the quarry, quarry face there. This area was tips from the quarry and Dowdale Village in the Midshires Way, where it says track. And Coming up later, um, we'll get to see something about Rockhead Spring, which is in this area. You can see the, the way that the, the valley is really confined with the, the, the green is the road, the black and white is the railway, in between you've got a river. And it, it's all very, um, shall we say, very tight. Just going back to the 1890s, I think this map was about 1895. Uh, I tried to um, identify it by other uh, things on the map. It covers the whole of Buxton. I think this is a geography map. And um, it shows the starts of quarry workings, Ashford Dell Works line just down there. That's expanded to fill that area and probably a lot more. Nothing over this side on the Cowdale side. And the next map we've got, and I'm completely forgotten where I managed to get this one from. <coughs> it shows um, the side of the, the valley that contains the, the working parts of the quarry. From here, for another quarter of a mile, is the quarry floor going out to the quarry face. 
The road is there down in the bottom of the valley with the river next to it and the railway across the other side there. These parallel lines are contours and uh, I've not tried to work out um, how high or how deep the valley is but the very fact that they're so close together uh, indicates that it is very steep. You can park up on the A6 down here somewhere, not recommended. You can walk up this track and after about 20 yards you come to a, a gate with a no entry sign. So that's a bit of a pointless exercise. You could walk along the main A6 road as I did many many years ago going home from school um, but the traffic's increased a bit since then and you could look up and see these buildings through the trees. Um, definitely not recommended at all these days. These are buildings that we'll be having a little look at as we go along. Starting with the one at the top left hand corner, the gatehouse. Now these buildings were designed by a local architect by the name of George Garlick and he was extremely pro prolific um, probably between about 1890 and 1920. Um, he built the Moorcroft on Burlington Road, the Rowans and the Towers on College Road, but who's mainly known for scores of terraced and semi-detached houses all over Buxton. He um, cooperated with Robert Parker on three houses around, around the park. And they're very often loosely attributed to Parker and Unwin, but they were actually Parker and Garlic. This was in the days, I think, before Parker and Unwin got together. So he was asked to design buildings for the Buxton Line firm in 1909, and it needed a robust style, and he got one. And robust mainly because of the blasting. He used cast concrete and it was a very early use of cast concrete and he used as far as possible limestone from the site crushed up and then used as aggregate. The style has been described as upper Nile, solid Egyptian building um, of a style that was popular about 5,000 years ago and to this he added the, the frieze, the dental moulding which is probably not Greek, um, Egyptian. Um, the whole thing uh, has sort of Art Deco overtones 15 years or so before the phrase Art Deco was coined, <coughs> sitting in between Art Nouveau and Art Deco. Some years ago, um, Alan Roberts let me have an article out of a, a professional magazine that he obviously took at work up at um, Health and Safety establishment and um, it was called Egypt in the Peak and it was by Dr H Eisner and to quote from it uh, he says that Derbyshire buildings were lovely, lovingly catalogued by Nicholas Pevsner the, the art historian except one which goes unnoticed and so far unsung but may last longer than Chatsworth and sadly it was wrong but um, this was the, the, the powerhouse that um, he was referring to. He says it's hidden from the road by trees. The early um, garlic powerhouse is in front of him as well, but the um, powerhouse, powerhouse itself is a sanctum sanctorum, a temple straight out of Aida or the magic flute. And sadly, it, it's no longer with us. The entrance to the powerhouse is particularly imposing, just like a it says something out of um, Aida, with the date 1909 and the letters BLF, Buxton Line Firm, above the door. A couple of other buildings that were on the map, the Upper Gate House, the motif was even applied to minor buildings that were well out of sight. And uh, 
He also used similar designs at um, Peakdale. I know there's one on the corner of uh, Dale Road and um, the road through Peakdale, uh, which in recent years it's had a pitch roof put on it, so it's um, hidden the detail a little bit. And many other places around the the um, quarry sites around Buxton. 1909 also saw the kilns built. They're um, 16 metres high, which is what about 50 feet. So um, don't go exploring. The buttresses were added about 1930 and needed to strengthen them. And at the same time, they were also added to a quarry. Uh, a of BLS at uh, Miller's Nail, which is probably more visible than this one. The kiln works simply by um, adding limestone followed by coal, followed by limestone, followed by coal, um, getting it very hot and every so often taking the, the lime, the burnt lime from the bottom, which is traditionally the way it had always been done. And next I've got three interesting photographs that are found in a book, um, an ICI book, uh, published in 1940. Um, ICI took over BLF in the late 20s, 26, I think. Um, they published a guide for users of explosives. Um, the idea was uh, it was available for use in demolition, mining, and as well as quarrying. But uh, I think it was useful to um, ICI that uh, Cardell Quarry, uh, if you can get a camera in the right place, can be photographed. I think a lot of quarries um, would quite be so easy. So that is the quarry face before blasting. And the camera's just caught the, the stone falling and that's the pile of stone afterwards and what we can see on here is the railway line their own internal railway narrow gauge railway comes up from the kilns and then it divides up to go across the quarry floor and approach the quarry face and i remember walking through there not long after it had closed in the 50s and these lines were fanning out all, all, all over the place. They've probably been ripped up for scraps since then. I don't think we'll find them hidden under the, the grass there. Also look carefully at the little wagons there. They're called um, Jubilees and they were the workhorse of um, mines and quarries all over the country. Uh, first built in the 1880s by Robert Hudson and Company and they were international suppliers of light railway equipment. This particular example is at the uh, Elsica Mining Museum just north of Rotherham. So, 1953, February, cold winter, moved into that little cottage there. This has taken um, not recently, I think in the 90s, I took it from the top of the quarry face looking across towards Tim Lodge. And the building in the left hand side there is at Cowdale Quarry. So between the camera and the house, the land goes right down probably 150 200 feet to the A6, the river and railway in the bottom, up again to Ashwood Dale Quarry, and then down again almost as deep into Cunningdale. So um, if you wanted to walk from the camera to the house uh, in a straight line, you'd need climbing equipment. Note the tree there, because on the next one, we're looking at it from the other direction. Um, and that's a quarry face from the lane near Tim Lodge. In the background, you can see the old Harper Hill quarry that I never remember actually in use over there. 
So when did it close? There's all sorts of dates quoted, 1949, 54, 55. And some stories it was reopened in the late 40s and used into the 50s, which could be right. Uh, another story that it was used for storing stone or coal, which is highly doubtful because access is virtually impossible. It's designed as a one-way system for getting stone out of the quarry into railway trucks, and it just doesn't work in reverse, um, which precludes it really from being used for industrial purposes, as we shall see. Um, I definitely remember it in 1953, uh, 1953, 54, and my own theory is that it closed in 54. Um, one thing I do remember is walking along uh, Ashwood Dale, when you could walk along there, we'd go and do some shopping, my mum and me and my sister, and we'd walk back along Ashwood Dale if we uh, and we missed the bus or at the time it was wrong for the bus. In those days, blasting was not quite as accurate as it is today. And they closed the A6. They sent a couple of flagmen down at either end of the quarry premises and closed the road. And on one occasion, we were in the middle of that exclusion zone when the flagmen came down in front of us and behind us and they started blasting. So we, we speeded up a little bit. So we could get to the dam shrines and shelter. So we moved forward. This is a quarry floor in, I'm not sure when this was taken, but I've I took a similar one in 1993. Um, it shows the quarry being used for grazing. So in 40 years, the whole quarry had, had grassed over and was suitable for use. It was also in use for rock climbing. Not quite my sport, but um, it was um, a popular rock climbing place in back in those days. Um, climbing on limestone only developed in 1960s and it, it was due to technical developments really with climbing equipment before then it had been restricted to grit faces but climbing in quarries is particularly dangerous because um, after blasting um, you can have a, a quite a fractured surface with loose rocks and so on <coughs> but uh, nevertheless it was popular and um, up until Climbers being precluded from climbing in there, it was still known as um, Staden Quarry, probably because that climbers' access will be through Staden. So, 1993, it was offered for sale. I say I had finally decided that they weren't going to reopen it and wanted to sell it. And from what you remember, that the asking price was about £105,000. So I went along there a couple of times with a friend and took some photographs and we, we generally sort of explored the whole, as much as, of the site as we could get at. And, um, I then um, suggested that the Civic Association, because it had land at Lovers Leap adjoining the quarry, that they might be interested in having a, a look at a possible purchase. And I went along there with um, Linda Carr, who was chair at the time, and also Dave also. And I think many of you remember both of those. Um, it wasn't going to happen simply because of the liabilities. Uh, maintaining the trees down onto the road, stopping them falling onto traffic, um, I think would have been an expensive nightmare. Around the same time, or soon after that, I went along with an officer from High Peak Borough Council to try to raise awareness of the importance of the site in quarry history. Nothing happened. That's the top of the um, quarry face as it was then. That's the now the mid shires way so you can walk along there but you won't be able to approach the quarry face because of lots of fences and lots of keep out notices. I've got a few photographs here that um, 
have probably been taken in the last 15 years or so. <coughs> this is the, the bottom of the kilns, wagons uh, waiting to be filled, just everything abandoned. And another one, a view inside, and um, I remember you could actually go into these um, at the base of the kilns many years ago. And um, some of the equipment there, some of the lifting equipment. So um, it was sold eventually, and it was sold to Paul Hocknell, who uh, was a local businessman and had these eyes on taking the water from Rockhead Spring up to a, a building he got at um, Staden and bottling it. He got permission in 2000 for pipeline between the two and um, he started to bottle it and I'm not sure which came first his death or um, whether he'd already decided that it wasn't uh, profitable but that led to a G whiz scheme to build a bottling plant in the base of the quarry itself and this is a, an artist's view of it at the time, looking towards Staden. So the first planning application went in in 2009, along with a lot of other people I objected, and um, I objected along with the Buxton group on this one, um, simply because uh, access is virtually impossible. At this time, that called Phil Jones from Cardale, joined us and uh, he's an extremely good letter writer and he's continued to promote the corner of uh, Cowdale Quarry ever since. Um, criticising objectively schemes like this when they came along. The plans were sub resubmitted in 2010 and refused. He had another go in 2011 was refused. They kept throwing things in like a, a climbing centre, heritage centre, but it would need major works to get into the site from the A6 in Ashford Dale and bearing in mind it's probably 150 feet above the valley bottom, wouldn't be easy. Um, they were looking at cuttings with walls about 26 metres high and the general thinking at the time was that um, they wanted a license to extract, extract stone, and once they'd done that, they'd abandoned the whole project and, um, and possibly they'd leave it open for development of um, light industry or something like that. You know, it's probably a very cynical view, but um, of course, nothing's ever admitted. So, again, back to the bar house. Um, this is the same slide that we saw a while ago, the, the famous Aida building, and this is uh, what happened in June 2011. It was in the way where they wanted to build the road. High Peak Borough Council building inspectors allowed it to happen and were criticised for it. They signed off the request without discussing the, uh, the project with anybody. English Heritage were furious, but uh, they in turn did nothing to stop it being destroyed. The planning application, the 2011 one, went to appeal after being refused. And what was flagged up there was that uh, in 1997, that's four years after I'd first flagged it up, uh, English heritage had decided that it was very impressive remains of an early 20th, early 20th century limestone quarry and recommended scheduling the whole site. Kilns, power house, powder house, all of high importance, in fact national importance. And that stage they recommended limiting vegetation, vegetation and allowing a slow decay. 2001 was a further assessment by English heritage and they recommended scheduling the whole site and creating a visitor centre. Of course, significant resources will be needed. So 
So at that point, there was a danger that a road could be completed and a quarry, as I say, sold off as a general industrial land. The inspector's summary um, is worth uh, quoting from. He says that the historical importance has long been recognised as long ago as 1997. And put my own exclamation marks after that. He described the building as enormous. Bottler, um, the bottling plant, um, the 2000 application, he says, had already failed. And um, the appeal was dismissed because of it would cause significant harm to a scheduled monument with the access road. That was the only objection. Um, Phil Jones. <coughs> Um, as part of his submission to the appeal, came up with this drawing. Instead of a cutting, they were going to ha have a tunnel to tunnel up from the A6 up to the quarry floor. And Phil took as his base the Dartford tunnel, which is 8.6 metres across, and uh, he superimposed on it the proposed tunnel to get up to the quarry floor at 17 metres across. Um, all you can say is wow. Yeah. There were objections to these applications at the time from as far afield as Kent and the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. And the only thing is you can say is that it must have cost a fortune in council fees and uh, reports to put it all together. I think the, the council fee itself was about two thousand pounds, and um, you don't get much in the way of reports for. And less than say 10 or 20,000 pounds. So they all went away and things went quiet for a few years. And then Nestle came along to rescue the project. And here, going back to our original map, there's the loop in the river again. The, this bit is a quarry tip. The quarry floor starts here with all the buildings along the and the spring is there, and they finally agreed line of a pipe to water swallows going up this way. There's Tim Roger Kane, Bailey Flat Farm, over the top, and along the long straight road that goes up to um, Daisy Mere, and then water swallows. And uh, this was a, shall we say, a, um, a negotiated uh, route. I think at first he wanted to put it up to up Cunningdale, which is the has been the most direct route onto Water Swallows Road, but they were prevented from doing that because of the uh, importance of um, the, the flora and fauna through Cunningdale. The approved route still goes through an SSI SSSI in this area. And it's still is, uh, quite a sensitive area, but um, um, hopefully it will all settle down. So, this is where we're up to. Barbed wire fences and, um, and notices and gates. Uh, when I inquired 12 months ago about the, the ownership of the whole area, and um, it seems that the the quarry face and the quarry floor are owned by Nestle, and the heritage buildings uh, and the woods and um, on the side of the hill going down to the valley are owned by the Hocknell family st still. So they only sold off the uh, the quarry itself. So they're both um, areas that have the liabilities and have very little commercial value. So uh, I think there's very much to be resolved there, and uh, we can only look to the future really to see what happens. So I think that's uh, all I've got to say on the subject for the moment, and um, I'm hoping there'll be one or two interested and interesting questions. If well, we thanks, sort of Trevor. That was brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah th thanks, Fran, for uh, doing the technical bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, has anyone got any questions? Um, 
can you tell me um, all those notices about keeping out? Were the to keep out of the Nestle land at the beginning? Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the, the quarry face is an obvious um, danger, but I mean, cliff faces, quarry faces, are, are, are gone. Be careful. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Well done. <laughs> um, it, quarry face is an obvious danger, but then uh, the, these dangers are all over the place. And actually climbing in a quarry, um, I don't see a problem with that at all. Um, the heritage buildings, if they've been scheduled as uh, monuments, then um, really they should be looked after and shouldn't be a danger to anybody. I think that the, the ideal answer to me would be to open some sort of a heritage centre there. And it's something I've thought for a long time, but um, it, of course it's difficult to access. I suppose until then it's going to be um, closed to the public. I think when you mentioned um, the original route of the pipeline for Nestle went through Cunningham, I think it actually was going to go through Pictou Woods, which is the site of a special site of interest. It is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think the now the route they've taken doesn't go through a site, a special site. It, it, it goes, it sort of uh, around, goes around it. Yeah, it goes. It just goes around it. Yes. Yes. So, in actual fact, the the new route is is much better than the old one. But, but you know, as far as yeah, it, concerned, it's an improvement, but uh, not for Nestle. It's a longer route and probably more. Well, I know, but as far as yeah, as far as we're concerned, concerned, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone else have a question? No? no. Oh. Um, how, the, the, the buildings that you described, uh, Helen, uh, and then you showed a JCB uh, sort of destroying part of it, did, but some of the buildings have been preserved. They didn't knock them all down with that, that Jason. That's the only one that was lost, and arguably the most important, but um, right. the rest are still there. Right. But that was that nice sort of Aida building you showed. That's right, exactly, yeah. And that was destroyed. That, that was the gem of the buildings out that was oh, uh, yeah. destroyed. <coughs> How sad that was. I do remember it. I, I couldn't have guessed the year, but when, mm. when was that? 2009, was it? 2010 or uh, June 2011, I think, when that was actually done. Yes, I seem to remember there was a lot of fuss in the advertiser. That's and right, yeah. People were um, extremely annoyed, but... Too late. Too late. Too late was the cry, yeah. Do we have any more questions for Trevor? Well, if not, I would like to thank you all for coming and I hope that you've uh, enjoyed what Trevor has managed to uh, tell us about uh, Cowdale Quarry. I've learned a lot. It's something that I, I knew about the bottling plant and the ownership, uh, the Hocken Halls, um, but I, I knew very little of its uh, ancient history. So uh, thank you, Trevor. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Well done. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Right. And uh, we'll see you all next month, I hope. Simon, have we, what, what's next month? It's actually next week, on the 26th, we've got uh, Richard Tuffrey talking about the present hotel, which should be quite interesting. Excellent. Okay. Um, the trials and tribulations and how they've got to this, um, this grand ending. So that, that'll, that's next at 7 o'clock uh, next Thursday. So if you haven't already got asked for an invitation, just let me know, drop me an email and I'll, uh, I'll send you one. Okay, well, you've heard it here, perhaps not first, but uh, you've heard it tonight. So, I wish you all a fun good night. <laughs>